everybody. Welcome back to the Climate Majority Podcast. Um, we're happy to have you here. We're sitting down with Landon McDowell. Well, uh, Landon, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me, man. Absolutely, man. Yeah, I, uh, I ran into you once again, you know, via Instagram, um, as things do, um, you know, through the, P- the POV channel. I remember following you. I think it was after you sent Desert Gold. I think it popped up on my feed and I was just like, wow, like who the hell is this kid? Um, I got to follow him and, you know, I've been following you ever since and, uh, it's been quite a progression, um, to see you go through. So, you know, we're here to to talk about that. And, and, uh, so let's just kind of dive into it real quick. Um, I'm interested, um, you know, we dive, we dive deep into people and how they found climbing. Um, you particularly, at least, you know, with my limited knowledge, um, uh, how, how old are you Landon? I'm 21. So I'm like, I'm just a baby, man. Okay. Yeah. So you're young. Um, you know, I won't spoil it too much, but you've already climbed desert gold, um, which is, and and full disclaimer, I have not sent it. Okay. You're still on it. You're in the roof, (laughs) you know? And so, you know, you're on a, a, what's that? 13 B I think 13 a 13 a. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So 13 a roof crack, you're, you're projecting this, you're, you're, you know, younger than you are now. So that's a huge accomplishment. I'd like to, to go back in the past a little bit and, and, Talk to us a little bit about how you found climbing and, you know, when you started climbing and kind of bring us to that point where you got to desert gold. Yeah. So I started climbing at probably age 14 or 15 years old. And I actually started at like an outdoor retreat. So like I was, I was sent away for a week to, uh, in St. George's, this Canyon called Crawdad Canyon. Did you do something bad? No, I didn't do something bad, um, <laughs> but it was it was similar vibes to like wilderness therapy, but it was not. I did not do anything bad. OK, <laughs> um, yeah. but I, I went to this and through part of this camp, there was like a rock climbing day and we got to climb real rock. And like the entire entire week, like leading up to it, I was like, hey, are we going to go rock climbing? We're going to go rock climbing. Can we go? Rock, when can we go rock climbing? Well, we went rock climbing and I was hooked, man. Like I remember like on the drive home, like my mother picked me up on the drive home. I had somehow convinced her into ordering me shoes and a harness. Like on the drive, I remember like I'm on her phone buying them off the internet. And then fast forward, I found the climbing gym, I ended up being on the climbing team at the comp. I actually only did one comp. I learned I hated competitions and I started climbing outside and this was in Logan, Utah at the time. So I started climbing up Logan Canyon. Wow. So at like a, a gym situation, um, right into comp climbing, you're climbing super young, age 14. Um, that puts you at seven years of climbing experience at this point. Does it not? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, how much of that was consecutive and how much of that was kind of broken? Like, did you take breaks or have you been pretty hardcore about it? So from like age, like 14, 15, I was pretty much balls to the wall until like this last year, mm. uh, with the exception of a collarbone break, probably at like 15 or 16. Was that climbing related? No, that was on a dirt bike. Okay. Um, what, what about climbing motivated you? What did you like about it? For me, it was a really nice way to have adventures. So I grew up in a really adventurous family. Um, I grew up doing things outside. I was really privileged and I really just wanted to go have an adventure. I wanted to go see how far I could push myself. What kind of, what kind of kid were you? Like, if you would like self-describe yourself, are you like really calm, collect, super rambunctious? Like what, what is the alert of climbing based on kind of your temperament? If that makes sense. I, so to give you an idea, as a kid, I was diagnosed with ADHD <laughs> and oppositional defiance disorder. Sorry, I wasn't laughing. I just like, I had that. I that's no, exactly no, what no, I you can laugh. Mind, so I was like, okay, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I was, I was diagnosed with ADHD and oppositional defiance disorder or ODD. And like, I like grew up at like the skate park, like skateboarding and like Sick. punk rock. I played music, like nice, really like rebellious. Like <laughs> I wanted, to, you know, as, as, I wanted to stick it to the man, even though I grew up in little 
Logan, Utah. <laughs> I didn't know that they had a, a clinical diagnosis for being a rebel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's almost a flex. <laughs> okay, nice. You're like, I'm going to get the doctor to tell me that I'm this. <laughs> yeah, no, I just think it's so, uh, you know, it's just like so ubiquitous in the climbing community where, you know, there's just like people, they just need this outlet. And if you have a super rambunctious kind of defiant kid and you can go into this this sport that gives you a venture channels your focus your emotions um you know makes you work really hard and uh it's just such a good outlet you know and of course like from the show and anecdotes and just people i know so many people are kind of fit what you're talking about you know like of course like i'm not projecting myself onto you but for me you know like i didn't find climbing that young but i know like i was that kind of kid you know super anti-authority really like attention deficit issues like super rambunctious and energy like climbing would have been the perfect outlet for me i think it was like hockey and other sports at the time but yeah that's awesome man um how quickly did you get into trad climbing because i think that like it's gym sport trad you know alpine objectives like what was that progression like for you yeah so i was in the gym but i was the gym was always like the gym was never where i wanted to end up like in my brain i always wanted to climb outside i wanted to climb real roots i remember very specifically seeing like the video of like mason earl climbing cobra crack and like i was like i want to do that that is cool and i got to the gym and the first thing that i immediately started to do was try to find someone to teach me how to track climb like i had taught myself how to sport climb off youtube um i somehow didn't have an accident i was definitely like a flight risk for the first little while but like my number one goal was to find somebody to teach me how to trad climb. And then at about age 17, I was able to find someone who taught me how to trad climb. And what was that process like for you? Like, how did you find that person? How did you connect with them? And what was the learning process like? Yeah, so that person was actually one of the coaches at the time at the gym. And I was climbing and basically nonstop the entire time I at practice was like, probably practice was like 40% climbing and 60% of me just like asking questions about outdoor climbing yeah. and just trying to chase that end goal. <laughs> just broke them down. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a hard time finding uh, partners for outdoor climbing when you were in the you know younger years, early, early stages? Y yes and no. Um, for sport climbing up the Canyon, I was lucky enough. That there was actually a community of kids my age that would go out and climb at the China cave. Um, also like I got into climbing and I immediately grabbed my best friend and I was like, Hey, you're learning how to boy. And like, I, I, we call him his, his nickname's Linguini and poor Linguini. <laughs> I dragged him everywhere. And like, there's a photo of him, like on his first outdoor rock climb, it is like a V zero 20 foot high ball without pads. <laughs> oh, shit. Like, <laughs> and I feel so bad for him, but I, I instantly had a climbing partner cause I had a best friend <laughs> and he liked it. Luckily. That's good. Good old Linguini. Yeah. Is, he, is he still your bully partner? <laughs> he is not. Um, we stopped climbing years ago. He kind of, he, he pursued music and he's actually a very, very talented musician. Nice. Okay, awesome. Cool. Good for him. That's sweet, man. Oh yeah. So you've been climbing in these gyms, you know, you're kind of getting better. You're starting to pursue the outdoors and the interest in that. Like, what's that kind of progression like for you? And and how quickly, like, you know, did you really get into knowing like, hey, I have a proclivity for this. Like, I'm I'm good at this and, and I want to excel at it. Yeah. So I think where I first started to learn that, like, this is something that I can do and this is something that I can be good at is. Part of this time is I had a rope and I had gree gree and I had a harness, but I did not have draws. So that kind of left me to like there was one crag in Logan that had perma draws on it, and that's the China Cave. I um, mean, the China Cave is really significant because that at the time, you know, it was developed by Boone Speed and like people like Anthony Chertuti and like Bill Boyle. And so, like, at one point, that had America's first. This is debated, but America's first 514B, which is super tweak. Um, but everything had permadraws. 
So I was kind of just starting to hang dog my way up these like 13s and like there were some hard 12s and I would get nowhere close to even sending them. But the important part is I was able to go climb outside. Wow. So you just went right into the gauntlet. Yeah. And like in my mind, I was like, well, it's overhanging. There's quick draws on the wall. I have a rope. Like what could go wrong? Did anything ever go wrong? No, um, definitely like things should have gone long, like wrong. And I definitely took a ton out of the experience, like, or out of the luck jar and put it into the experience. jar. Yeah, no, really interesting. And, and so kind of like throwing yourself into the gauntlet for that. Did you ever have like an aversion to falling or fear? Or did you find yourself kind of just back to that, like pulling out of the luck jar more of like this, uh, fearless individual just charging on and that worked in your favor so i don't think i had like a large fear of falling in the beginning because ignorance is bliss right like i didn't know what could go wrong and i just remember watching this clip of mason earl on cobra crack like taking these massive whippers onto nuts and i was like oh that's just normal like that is just rock climbing and so like in the beginning not so much. And then as I started to learn about like fall forces and like what can actually go wrong and like hearing people have accidents, then I like started to get scared and realized that this is a very real sport. Did you have any close calls yourself, like with gear or with a like an accident where you're like, wow, that could have really gone wrong? There is definitely some time. So I spent, you know, the last the last two years of my climbing career, I spent in Zion National Park and we were doing these. It's it's a little silly, but I love it. We were trying to recreate like big wall speed climbing but in National Park, me and my my main partner, Connor Beatty. And it seemed like every single wall we did, like there was definitely like, oh, that was like, fuck. like we definitely got away with something at some point on every wall that we did. Um, although early on in my trad climbing career, I did deck. Ooh. Um, I did, did not deck hard, but I ripped out the first piece. Wow. How high up were you? Wow. Oh, uh, probably only 10. OK, so do you guys are you guys familiar with City of Rocks at all? I'm not. No, I've heard of it, but no. Okay, so there's this route. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of it. It's next to Short Circuit, and it's on the right. But there's like you climb up, and there's this ledge, and then like on one side of the ledge is the wall, and then there's another like what we'll call like almost like a fence, but it's also made out of rock. So what had happened is I had ripped out the first piece, and then I fell into this chasm in between that like rock fence and the wall. And luckily, like, it could have gone much worse if I would have fallen on the other side. Hmm. And how did that how did that affect you psychologically? Like, was that really a deterrent for you or were you still, you know, just like. Charging, taking the bull by the horns. <laughs> I I think it first off, it scared me. But second off, like, I was like, I need to get back on the horse. And I immediately, like, fired it. But I remember, like. I finally got to the top of the pitch and the top of the pitch is a little bit run out on easier chicken head climbing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh, I'm really scared. Like if I fall right now and then that piece rips out, just like I had a piece rip out at the beginning of this climb, like it's going to go really poorly. And I think that was one of my first exposures to like a proper run out too. Yeah. I think it's interesting. We, when we see gear rip or we experience gear ripping firsthand, it kind of like opens this door of like, oh, that can happen. And then all of a sudden you start to like your analyzation of risk changes because it's not like, oh, if I fall, this piece is going to catch me and I'm going to take a whip. It's like, oh, I'm going to fall. And like, what happens if this piece rips? What happens if both of them rip? You know, and it's like, you don't really know, you know, how well can you judge your own placement? Is that going to hold? You don't really know until you fall on it. You can be pretty certain you know, depending on rock quality and your placement and how well it is. But in the end, the one thing I've learned, it's like, you don't really know until you fall on it. And it's just kind of like this haunting, haunting fact that we all live with as, as climbers. Um, and it's a, it's a little bit of a gamble, but um, 
I, at least at this point, since I've already destroyed both my ankles, I don't have two more to spare. <laughs> um, <laughs> for me, it's like, I'm going to climb, you know, on trad at least within a realm of capabilities where I'm pretty much in control. And then if I'm coming off the wall, it's cause like something crazy happened. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's my own bias at I this think, point. I think to elaborate on that, like if, if I would analyze like my own climbing style, it's it's obviously like to someone who is a highly competent, capable, smooth rock climber moving well. Like this, does, you're not describing me, you know, like I'm very much calculating based off of the kind of paradigm that you're talking about, Kyle, which is like, if I fall on this piece and this piece rips, what's my next calculation era? You know what I mean? And how confident am I in that piece? Because, you know, the severity factor can go up like so quick. And and like, I'm okay with that. I'm not, you know, big sender, crazy climber. I'm going to take up an extra couple cams. I'm going to double up some pieces in a scarier area for myself personally. And, and I'm kind of going to climb through and I'm, I'm not going to calculate optimistically based on like, okay, well, if I fall, this is a clean fall. But if that piece rips, I'm going to like, you know, cheese grater myself on slab for 30 feet. It's like, I'm not going to take that like calculation. I'm going to assume that piece would fail and like what is the next piece that is going to like be potentially helping me out if that makes sense and i think you know you already uh alluded to this landon you know back to our whole like cobra crack analysis yeah um, you know it's like well of course like if if your climb is like this like overhanging you know like bulge you're pulling you can go whip all day and just fly into free space and it helps if you're, you know, a professional climber like Mason Earl and placing great pieces as well, you know. Um, but yeah, the, there's just so many factors into climbing that can affect so many things, right? It's it's really really interesting. Correct. And and early on, I was taught to aid climb, and I think Dude, aid yeah. climbing that is the number one thing that gave me trust in my gear and mm -hmm. taught me what holds and what doesn't hold. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that was a, a sentiment. Who 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 told us about that, Max? I forget. Um, but it blew my mind when I heard that. Might have been Josh. I was like, Re Reinig, oh, I think possibly it might have been Reinig. Yeah. yeah, I was just like, because I was so against aid climbing. I was like, it's slow, it's boring, blah blah blah. You know, like I'm all about the movement and everything. And I never thought of it as a way to build a relationship with the gear. Um, and to anybody listening that's like trying to get into track climbing or um, went through a fall and is trying to rebuild trust. Um, I know we've talked about this on the podcast before, but just like Landon said, aid climb, get out there and stand on gear, get used to using the equipment and just like bounce on it, like sit on it, test on it, like understand what it's like under load without having to go take a whip on it. And, you know, if it fails, you break your ankles. It's like, that's not a very good game to play. Yeah. What, what I like to tell aspiring trad climbers is first off, I ask them, do you know how to top rope solo? If that answer is yes, what I then say is, okay, go, okay, go top rope solo, but aid climb your entire way up. Mm -hmm. Try to make your gear fail. Try to place as awful as gear possible and see if it holds. Place great mm -hmm. gear, see if it holds. Just play and see what holds, see what doesn't hold. Also, taking whippers with a back rope of a top rope is yes. with a backup as a top rope is yes, awesome. Dude. Yeah, I did that right after my accident. I was like, I need two blayers. I'm going to get one for the lead rope, one for the top rope, and I'm going to get dish out some slack and I'm going to take a whip. And it really helped me. I was like, wow, like this is amazing. It's, it's a game changer. That's really, really good advice for someone to just build confidence, work on skills, or even, Hey man, maybe you've taken the entire winter off and you've been ice climbing and doing, you know, mountaineering or different things. And you want to like spend one day outside just beginning of your season and, you know, go do your suggestion land and it just, pop in a million pieces, work on them, pull on them, rope solo, get a good physical day in. Like that's a really good way to probably start off the season and, and then also maybe take some, some falls. Um, so Landon, you know, you, you came out of the gym, you're projecting these really hard sport climbs pretty quickly. Um, one thing that you said when we, you know, set up the meet and greet for this podcast was that you were a reformed elitist. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm personally super interested in this topic, so I, I hope you're willing to to share a little bit about your mindset back in the day. Um, at what point, I guess, describe this mindset and describe how it kind of came to fruition. Like, how did that manifest itself? Yeah, so 
I, I think I'm I'm gonna start with the reformation. Um and what that took me to reform is me taking a large break off of climbing and like spending more time around the average climber. Um like all three of my roommates are phenomenal climbers and two of them are professional climbers. And like into speaking of them and how they handle climbing and how they talk to people it was really like, oh, like you're like a nice human. People respect you because of that. Where like me in my in my climbing time, like I was like a firm believer in like, well, like there's a chance that like, yeah, like you got hurt on that route. You had no business being on it. Like you shouldn't have been there. Um, like, you know, I spent a lot of time in Zion. Zion was my passion project. It still is, um, but in different ways. But like people aiding up Moonlight Buttress and keep in mind, like I am an aid climber, like I've I've climbed hard aid. I really like aid climbing, but like people climbing, like aid climbing Moonlight Buttress was just not OK with. Me. Um, Why? Um, OK, so my view is that Moonlight Buttress is one of the most classic free climbs in North America. Um, It's C1. It takes, you know, like. Indian Creek style gear the entire way up. What aid climbers do to that wall um, is first off, they slow everything down. Now you have to pass parties. Um, if you're trying to climb the the Enduro corner off Rocker Blocker and there's some dude trying to figure out if it's a 0.4 or a 0.5 in the back of the off with, like he's taken like an hour and a half and you're like, I'm trying to get up the wall. Um, and now I've kind of just been like, just let people do what they want to do. Like people are just out here to have fun. Not everybody's out here trying to send the narbar, you know? I think that's a, such a, like an interesting point that you've like brought up here. And I think like most things in life, there's so much nuance and complexity to them and you can kind of analyze them from both sides. And you know, for me, I'm never going to be free climbing the moonlight buttress. So, you know, like I might be able to aid climb it. But at the same time, I completely like, let's even just extrapolate to a different scenario. You're some guy, the moonlight's your goal. You've been climbing, you know, a year training for it. You fly out down to Zion. This is like the one of the only days you can get on and you go there and there's like a party just like aid climbing, like holding up the entire route. I think that's a that's a really interesting point to discuss is like, I think ultimately everybody has a right to be on climbs. Um but I do think, yeah, some of the harder, more classic climbs, that is a really interesting, complex thing. Like you could say the same thing about like the nose on LCAP, you know, if you're like not experienced enough, you can't move correctly and you just, you know, you're stuck for two days, like, you know, on the great roof or whatever. And like, there's like five parties behind you all just sitting there baking in the sun, watching their water going down. It's like there, there are other, like, this is a sport that in and a this lot happens. of ways can be done in relation to other people like that is it's it's not just this like you know satellite yourself out in space doing this it's like your your actions can affect other people so i don't know i do struggle with that of i think everybody has a right to climb but then at the same time there is nuance and complexity in that like and i can totally i can see it from either store either side you know what i mean correct and you know and and what I would tell people is like, well, why are you aid climbing Moonlight Buttress? Why wouldn't you go across the river to Touchstone? Like Touchstone's of the similar grade. There is a C2 pitch. Um, unpopular opinion, you can do it a C1 if you know the right gear. But, um, and like, that's a very similar climb that you could go aid climb and not, you know, break away from the predominant style that that route is done in. Can you explain the C grade to our audience? Okay, so there's okay, I'm gonna go in a little more in depth. So there's two types of aid climbing grades. There's A and there's C. C means clean. You're placing cams, nuts, hooks, um, cam hooks, although you don't use cam hooks on sandstone. And occasionally you're placing beaks and pitons, but you're not hammering them in and altering the root. Where A is you are hammering into the uh rock. Um but then in part of that, you know, you have A or C zero. And we'll just call it C for now. You know, we have C zero. And what that would look like is 
if you were to fall, you will not rip any gear and you will take a very small fall. Um, C1, you are very unlikely to rip gear. Although if you were to, it'd be, you know, anywhere from a one to two piece fall. Um, C2, if you, so you are going to start seeing body weight only placements, but you're only going to see one to two of them. And if you do rip one, you're starting to look into bigger falls anywhere. And, you know, and it's, and it's very, uh, subjective, but you're looking anywhere from like five to 10 to even up to 15 feet, uh, falls, um, depending on how good your gear is. And that's the hard thing about calling your route C2. Um, when I was early on in my career, I took a 40 foot whipper on a C2 cause I was bad at placing gear. But then now C3, we start to get into like real fall zones. Um, I've climbed C3, C3 and seen fall zones of anywhere from 10 feet to 70 feet. Um, you can start hitting ledges. You can start like hurting yourself, but maybe when you fall, you're not going to bail. We're like A4, like if you take a large whipper on C or A4, like you're going to start getting severe bodily harm. And then, you know, A5, um, you die if you fall. Now, we haven't had any confirmed A5 cases, but, you know. I've heard the A5, it's like, not only are you like leading out on these like sky hooks for multiple placements, but your partner's anchor is also those hooks, too. Correct, correct. And I've I've never climbed C or A5. Like, I've never climbed a 4 or a 5. So, like, I can't attest to that personally, suicidal. but it sounds... Yeah, it sounds heinous, but it's not. So, like, here's the thing. Like, um, I remember I was sitting at work one day with a colleague of mine, and he was a very competent aid climber. He'd climbed a lot of fours. And I said, well, you know, I said the statement, aid climbing is kind of like gambling. It's a lot of fun, but sometimes you get burned and sometimes you have a high reward. And he said, no, it's not at all like gambling. It is highly calculated. Because in your bounce test, you can generate enough force to determine if this piece is going to fail or not. Yeah, I could see that. Until you bounce test it too much and then you rip the next eight pieces below you. <laughs> but if you're bounce testing right, if you're bounce yeah. testing right, then you're going to rip that piece, but you're not going to generate extra force on the piece you're standing on while you're bounce testing. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, there's a right way to do everything, right? Um. Yeah. Now that yeah. being said, I have bounce tested pieces and ripped the pitch. Which <laughs> yeah. <just happens>. Yeah. <laughs> There's also a right way to die. <laughs> <laughs> I'd there say is. Aid climbing's the wrong way to die. <laughs> yeah. It's gonna, yeah. No, aid climbing could suck to die. That'd be really embarrassing. Yeah. Uh, nice. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the explanation. I want to um, dive back into the the kind of mindset we were talking about before. So, you know, the the moonlight buttress example is a pretty specific example. I'm, you know, and maybe this isn't you particularly, but at least in my experience, you are the closest person that I've spoken with that has kind of said that he's had this mentality before. And so I'm just going to lay out some examples of what I've noticed in terms of like, because, you know, I'm a part of the majority. Max is part of the majority. We represent the climbing majority. And I think that a lot of us see a lot of, um, negativity on whether it be Instagram or especially mountain project forums where, you know, like for instance, I posted my, uh, my accident report and people are like, you're going to die. You should never climb again. Like, you know, fucking idiot, blah, blah, blah. Or Instagram, you know, I run a POV channel. Like there's some people that come on and be like, everyone that climbs with the fucking GoPro is a guppy or whatever. I got to be completely honest with you, Kyle. I feel like at some point I left a mean comment on your POV channel. <laughs> I, I got to just be completely complete with you. There was probably like 18 year old me like, what the fuck is he doing? <laughs> okay, perfect. So and that's totally fine. I appreciate the honesty. So, um, you know, we have a large group of people entering the sport. A lot of people are doing it recreationally, you know, once a weekend, maybe less. Um, it's all about fun. It's all about just, you know, there's, you know, the psych level is the same, whether you're climbing 13 or five, eight for your first time. Like it's climbing is such a special sport that way, because for regardless of what level you're at, the, the experience is so overwhelming and, and, and engaging. And so it's like this magical thing for a lot of people. And so people like to share it. And so I, I agree. There's a, 
there's a segment of people that are creating content and out there just being fucking idiots. Like they're not safe. They're putting people in bad positions. They're um, doing things that are, you know, not according to the culture. And those people, I get, you know, the the judgment. But there's also this realm of like, you know, if you're not a good climber, you're gonna get shit on. Or if you're, you know, a GoPro, like you're gonna get shit on. So talk to us a little bit about kind of like that mentality that some of the climbers have and you know what that perspective is like for so and you know i think a large part in these elitist behaviors between you know gopros and people doing air quote gumby things is a lot of worry about getting areas and shut down and accidents happening and people wanting to protect what's theirs and having a hard time sharing crags with other people and having a hard time seeing other people in new areas, maybe having a hard time seeing people in areas that they hadn't seen people in before. But, you know, the GoPro comes out and suddenly like it's easier to find these areas because of the videos. Or people get hurt. And now this area that was actually probably we shouldn't have been climbing in in the first place is shut down. And I think people are really, really scared of change. And people are worried that this new scene will change things. In which I'd argue that if we're doing things correctly, more than anything, if somebody's doing something sketchy, that is a teaching opportunity. That's not an opportunity for you to be a dick. That's an opportunity for you to walk up and be like, hey, man, like, I think what you're doing is a little bit dangerous. Can I give you some advice? Yeah. Yeah. We've we've talked about that before. It's definitely a, an opportunity for teaching. We talked with Cody, the late Cody Bradford about that. Um, it's just like there's... Yeah, there's there's lessons there and there's ways to go about it. I think that unfortunately though in the digital space you can't really like DM somebody and be like, "Hey man, you know, that was fucking stupid. Let me teach you something" cuz I don't know how well that's going to be received. It depends. Well, so Kyle, I want to play devil's advocate for you real quick. Okay. Um in the aviation community, you know, in base jumping, speed flying, paragliding, um there is a there's a progression that people see and there's sustainability and if you progress too fast you know we have this competency level and we have this confidence level and if your confidence starts gaining but your competence is low then you're going to start getting hurt and we see this a lot and we see people that have been in the sport for 3 4 months and they're already doing things that you are people started doing 3 4 years and people will reach out and say, hey, like we've noticed you're progressing really fast. Like we've seen this cycle before. We've seen people get hurt. And that's a pretty regular thing that happens. And, you know, some people, you know, it just is like, hey, I don't want I don't want anything to do with you. Leave me alone. And other people are very, very take it well. And it helps them. Yeah, I think that's such like a, a commonality, like as far as like online, you know, communication, like I totally agree with you. I think there's room for either or. And I also think like the general blanket rule for online, at least in my mind, is just the nature of the modality for communication is so promoting to people who want to be hateful or negative or comment. And so I think that's never going to go away. And I think part of that also as people online is to just understand no, to not never. not take things super personally. Even if people are being mean to you, calling you out, attacking you, it's like you can't control what that person is saying or doing. Um, you know, and I know that's easier said than done, especially for so many different, you know, circumstances out there. But realistically, like that is probably the best thing we have possible to just try and you know rise above essentially like you can't control what that person's doing you're most likely not going to have a constructive conversation with the guy who's like yo fuck you you suck you know blah, blah, online it's like like this is not like in your like 40 character limit like oh blah, 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 like fighting them in the comment section it's like this is not constructive <laughs> at all but there is an opportunity to to leave um criticism in constructive manners for people i think and to reach out to direct message people you know, I completely agree with that. And, you know, like Kyle and I've talked about that as well before, too, with like, uh, you know, your your description of uh, competency and confidence, right? Um, you know, good example of this would be like Nathan, we just talked to him on the show. This guy is such a capable, unbelievable <laughs> yeah. athlete, amazing, like nothing negative to say about him, but he just got into I think it's paragliding and like, 
two months in, he's like broken his pelvis by like hitting his ass or something, you know? And I think that's something so common in like flying sport. But yeah, no, it's. But yeah, so, you know, there is this kind of whole dynamic of like online, but I think to like address like, you know, the whole previous thing of what we were talking about is like, and this, this placates into the moonflower but buttress and so many other things is does a climber have less intrinsic worth because they are worse at climbing? And I think that's a question that this community has to really ask itself. And, you know, if we go historically into climbing, it's this rebellious, hardcore, you know, uh, culture of just people, fuck you attitude, doing insane things, dying, risking their lives, doing these unbelievable feats, whether it's rock climbing, mountaineering, ice climbing, you, you name it, you know, like that is the culture. And now it's, of course, like going through this evolution of becoming mainstream. And as you become more mainstream and you have so much more adoption through the general population, the, you know, our air quotes majority, um, you now have this kind of like shared space and interaction and dynamic. And I think that's the fundamental question that we are getting at here is, do you have less intrinsic worth in the climbing community if you don't climb as hard as somebody? Well, and yeah, it's interesting you bring that up because something that I used to say, and I actually strongly disagree with this statement but something that i used to, i really thought this was true there are climbers and there are people who yeah. climb i totally get i like i don't want to project but i i get the distinction you're saying though i think you can word that in a different way now depending on how you're thinking about it but like yeah like if i was gonna like play myself into the shoes of that that like style of thinking it's like to me a climber is like somebody who like it's a lifestyle. They live, like eat and breathe climbing. And they are like, they are, they are good climbers, generally good, of course, subjective, depending on the level. But now the weird thing is, you can get somebody totally under that paradigm and mindset lives in a van, eats, sleeps and breathes climbing. And all they do is climb five, eight, you know, they might climb 200 days a year and just go around <laughs> the world, just like smashing all the sickest five eights. And it's like, well, what are you going to say? Like, is that guy? Cause he's not, you know, like on sighting 12 B sport or something. He's not a climber. It's like, I would argue like that's, that's insane. Like style of adventure. And, and you're also adhering to the adventure and the lifestyle, you know? So yeah, it's really interesting. And honestly, that five, eight climber is probably having a lot <laughs> yeah. more fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just saying. Uh, I'm curious, Landon, how you think about this. So I think that the one th sense of frustration I could totally understand from a climber versus a person who climbs is that a climber takes it seriously, is potentially trying to get recognized for their athletic accomplishments as a climber. Maybe that's sponsorship or recognition on social media or recognition through their peers. And there's these people that come out with their GoPros or, you know, they come out on Instagram filming the most you know, guppy shit ever. And they're blowing up on Instagram. And I could see how there would be like a sense of frustration of like, well, I've dedicated my entire life to climbing and I'm climbing, you know, way harder than this person. Why is this person getting more attention than me? And I could see a bit of resentment or frustration with like, where our attention is as a as a media source and what we find entertaining. And also just the fact that there, you know, there's so many hard climbers now that it's really hard to stand out without also bringing something else to the table. Yeah, it's it seems now that to and to be a professional climber, you have two roads, in my opinion. You can be an influencer, or you can be in the top two percentile. You can go on social media and you can build a platform and it doesn't matter how hard you climb and and it doesn't really matter in the end how hard you climb anyway. But you can build a platform and you can become a professional climber or an influencer that way or you can be a freak of nature and climb 15D. And climb out of the womb. <laughs> yes, yes, you are you are doing mono dead points out of the moon. Out of the moon. <laughs> yeah, no, but I agree, man. I think that 
it's an interesting position we're in. I, you know, there was a small point in my life where I was like chasing, you know, some sort of career in climbing and it, it you know, it was a very, um, ignorant view just because I didn't really understand what I was even getting myself into one and two, I had no idea what climbing hard was. And so it, it was a fun pipe dream, but you know, it's just like, you have to be, you know, born and raised and you have to be not only that you have to be genetically gifted to be pushing the sport as it currently stands. And that, that realm of influence is just going to get harder and harder to push. Um, and so, you know, people who just climb on the weekends or even people who live out of their van and go climbing across the country, it's like, it's just not enough anymore. You can't, you can't just live that lifestyle and expect to be some sort of recognized climber. And on top of that, even if you are a crusher, if you don't have a personality that sells products or sells brands, no brand is going to partner with you if you're a fucking asshole or if you're awkward and you can't you know, talk to people or you, know, you don't want to talk to people. You just want to hide in your van and you just want to climb. Like That's not marketable either. And so it's like, we're in this world where you have to have multiple skills. That's exactly what I was going to bring up next. Like if I personally were a brand, I would not care how hard anybody climbed. I would only care how much product they sold. Now, Max and I have talked about this and I won't go into any specifics, but I think there is a dark side to that because there are certain influencers that are getting sponsorships that I personally don't feel like should. Um, And, you know, it, it is a little bit sad that there is like a group of people that I wouldn't even call climbers at all, like, and are still getting some representation. And so it's like, obviously, the spectrum swings and there's people, you know, you have to have the full spectrum of everything. But I, I, I also see frustration where it's like, it sucks that that you know, certain things still sell. And that's just a representation of our society. Yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. I, I think to to add on to that, Kyle, is um, climbing is such a unique sport in my estimation, which could be really uh, biased in a lot of ways because I love it. But I feel there's so many climbing athletes out there who, if they had applied the same work ethic and genetic potential into like a team sport such as, you know, hockey or soccer, they'd be getting paid millions of dollars. And instead, we have these people who yes. are... Mm-hmm you know, their entire soul just dedicated. They eat canned beans and live out of vans and climb like 514B and C on gear and and they get paid minimally. And they're essentially just top tier genetic freak pro athletes on the globe who, if you were that talented in a team sport, you get paid millions and millions of dollars and you'd have resources and training centers and healthcare Whereas like in climbing, because it's this weird, rebellious kind of lifestyle and almost, I would argue, an art as opposed to just pure physicality, um, there is this lack of funding and support, which, you know, ideally in the future is going to change as climbing gets mainstream more. It'd be great to see athletes and these people in these kind of tiers receive more support. Um, but that's something that is really unique to it, you know, and and I could understand that. Hey, I'm this person i'm a pro climber i've dedicated my whole life to this i'm i'm you know amazing and and like literally just like sacrificing everything in my life to chase this dream and then some person you know like you know just comes along and doesn't like have remotely the investment or anything but they're better at you know making social media videos and using instagram and so they get like all the sponsorships you've been working your whole life for it's like of course i can sympathize with that and on some level that feels I don't want to use the word wrong. Totally. You can understand that. Like that is a very understandable position. Absolutely. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's complicated, man. You know? Well, and quite frankly, um, you know who I think is our real professional climbers guides. Yeah. 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 And honestly, they don't get as much love as they should. No, dude, the clients always trying to kill you or themselves. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> where that that comes from some sort of experience where have you do you have friends that are guides like talk to us about that you know what i spent so let's see i moved to st george when i was 18 and then from 18 to 20 i was a rock guide and a canyoneering guide in mm. st george and that's what i that's what i did to try to fund my dirtbag dream and i've seen it all man 
It's don't ever canyon guide. It's actually a lot of fun. I, I can't. It's not that bad. But canyon guiding is adult babysitting at its finest. <laughs> but you get fair. to do it in a pretty cool place. Yeah, that's the thing is like it's work and you're out in Red Rock, like not Red Rocks, the place, but like out in Red Rocks and natural terrain. And it's it's really, really fun. And on the flip side, um, in my experience, I got to see a lot of and I don't want to talk too negatively about it because I actually had a really, really positive experience. But you get to see a lot of people come in and trash the outdoors and that gives you an opportunity for teaching. Or bitterment and resentment. <laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> um, so Landon, um, you know, you you had this elitist mentality, you kind of reformed yourself, and now you don't really climb at all. Is that correct? Yeah, you know, I the last time I climbed, so I was I was really curious and I was, I was looking at my mountain project. And the last time that I climbed anything significant was at the beginning of December. And it was Monkey Finger with my good friend, uh, Zach. And that's a, if you're not familiar, it's a, I think it's, I want to say it's 10 pitches. Don't quote me on that. Uh, 12A in Zion National Park. And I was trying to do a red point burn. Um, didn't send. Didn't send the monkey finger pitch. If anybody's wondering, is this um, is this is this December of this year? No, no, last year, last year, okay, December okay. of twenty two. Okay. And then I moved to Salt Lake, um, and I actually moved to Salt Lake to further pursue a new hobby. And I did a solo of the Great White Icicle, and then other than that, I climbed Ancient Art, and that was the base jump off. I've climbed Castleton twice, both times the base jump off. And a little bit of single pitch cracking here and there. I'm so just patiently what, waiting for the ice to come in. What was the switch? Like why, you know, you were projecting desert gold. You had this, like, I would say proclivity to the sport. Um, what was there, you know, the reason we had, I had reached out in the first place was the Instagram post you had made where you were kind of having, it seemed like a little bit of an identity crisis trying to understand like, what your purpose was in life, maybe how you were supposed to support some sort of career. And I, and that really resonated with me is because like after this injury, I've refocused on career and like, you know, it's really easy to have climbing be everything, our identity, our, our, our value that we see ourselves as people. And when, you know, you start to question whether climbing is what you're supposed to be doing. Now you've not only not climbing anymore, but you've reached this void of like, well, who the fuck am I? Like, what am I supposed to do with my life? So was that something that you went through? Um, you know, talk to us about what that was like for you. Yeah, hundred percent. So kind of like the, if I, if I go back to the original question, the decline of my climbing was a mental health crisis. Um, my happiness was completely determined on my climbing ability, what I was climbing and what I was doing. And after some deep thinking, I realized that I was suffering so much in my day to day life from a lack of taking care of myself, a highly uh, emotionally abusive relationship. And then just like ultimately like really severe depression that I had done nothing about, absolutely nothing about that. When I was climbing, I was able to suffer a little less. So I could go to heinous, heinous routes and it was awful suffering routes, a lot of times really wide. And it didn't matter because I was still suffering less in my day to day life. Um, it is really, really easy to climb hard when your only purpose is to climb hard. It's your job. I'm sure that most people are semi decent at their job because that's what they do every day. If you feel like your job is to climb, then I'm not going to say it's easy to be a professional climber because it's obviously not, but it's easier if that's the only, that's your only motive in, the, in life. But then the moment that you drop off, that you fall off that plateau, that suddenly you don't know who you are. You don't know what you're doing. What show, like, why did you choose to stop? Like if it, if it was what was pulling you out of, you know, your, um, your, your particular situation in your life, why did you want to stop climbing instead of like diving into it deeper? 
Correct. So, so two, two answers to that question. Um, answer one is an easy answer. It's a cop out answer. I found another hobby that I was highly passionate about, um, that I could focus my time and energy into. Answer number two is I deeply noticed that my self esteem of myself and my happiness of the day was completely determined on how my climbing was. I feel like all of us have been at the crag and we've watched somebody throw a fit at the crag because they couldn't climb a route. That was me. And I'm really embarrassed by that, quite frankly. But climbing wasn't always a healthy thing for me. It wasn't always a, it, it went from a healthy outlet to express myself and get my energy out to like a form of self hatred and the self harm. Did you deal with uh, depression and anxiety or anything of the sort before climbing or did it start developing well, you know? Well, you know, I think it was so yes and no. So like I did deal with it throughout my teenage and my childhood years, but not to the severity. And then, you know, mental health issues starts to come up in males from, you know, like age 18 to 24. And I think it just happened to be that time. And, you know, I would refuse to go to therapy. I'd refuse to take medication. I refuse to do anything about it other than, you know, go set myself up on a rock climb you know, on a 2000 foot rock climb with a single rack of cams and like a mentality of like, well, we're just going to simul climb the entire thing and we're not going to take any food or bivy gear because we'll be up so fast. Mm. We'll be back by lunch. Yeah. Yeah. There is this really interesting, I don't know, phenomenon, maybe is the wrong word, but at least, you know, this is my experience that I've noticed in climbing is there is this large proclivity of people who just like adhere to climbing who are in some capacity in their lives troubled or suffering or searching for something. And climbing tends to be this outlet that kind of uh, fills the hole, you know, for a while, like the void, that emptiness that just like, you know, is like kind of all consuming in your life. Like it fills that for a while. And in some ways, maybe you can find a healthy relationship with it. And in other ways, you know, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it seems like you're alluding to climbing was a band-aid. You know, it wasn't fixing a problem. It was just, you know, covering the gaping wound Correct. and being like, well, when I go do this, the Band-Aid's not, you know, and then you go stop doing it and you tear the Band-Aid off. Or like you have a bad day out and your Band-Aid, you know, actually ends up making things worse, essentially. And that seems to be a phenomenon that I think is, you know, pretty consistent in the climbing community. I know a lot of people who really like climbing and the majority of people that I climb with in all forms of mountain sports, whether that's like trail running or anything or aerobic sports or rock climbing, ice climbing, they all have a proclivity for like masochistic slash like punishing behavior. And when you're punishing yourself so hard, you can't, you're not thinking about, you know, the state you feel when you're at home, you know, like how depressed you are, how unhappy you are Ex with yourself exactly. or any of these issues. You're just so absorbed in the moment and the beauty of the environment and all these things. And that's amazing. And I love it. And it's such a huge part of my life. But in a lot of capacities, that can also be a band-aid, right? Like if you're getting home and you're more and more depressed day after day and, you know, you're still not dealing with your issues and you're only feeling good when you're climbing, then you're not actually making progress in your life. You're just using climbing to fill the void. And that's like a really important distinction, I think, for people, right? Max, you you hit the nail on the head. Mm -hmm. That is exactly how I felt. It's yeah, it's when you're suffering in the mountains, you can't think about anything except for your suffering in mm -hmm. the mountains. You know, you're not worried about your problems at home. You're not worried about your problems at work. Like in your mental state, you're just like, wow, I'm really tired. I need to get to the top so I can <laughs> <Yeah>. repel. <laughs> so, Landon, what what? What was missing? Um, and with this new sport that you've gotten into, is it another Band-Aid? Or have you solved some of the underlying foundational problems that um, were kind of creeping into your life um, at, when you quit climbing? Yeah, so I think a big thing, um, a, a big, big thing was I was not taking care of myself at all. Um, I, would, I would climb. I would eat as many calories as I could, or sometimes none at all, depending on what my climbing next day looked like, which is really, really bad. Um, and now I'm able to take care of myself 
I'm able to stop and think about how I'm doing. I'm able to talk to other people about it. Um, and another big thing is, you know, in speed flying, paragliding, base jumping, it's highly weather dependent. You can't do it every day. Um, and so is climbing, but I think you're forced to deal with your problems because if you're having mental problems and you're on an exit point and you're about to base jump, well, you're going to get really close to being a fatality. Like you have to deal with those problems or you're going to die. Um, you can't, you can't be suicidal and base jump sustainably for a long time. Would you say that a large portion of, of base jumpers have suicidal tendencies? No, I would actually argue that. Okay. So I think there's two crowds. Um, uh, one crowd is, I want to go get rowdy with my friends and the other crowd would be highly calculated humans. And I would argue that a lot of the highly calculated humans are there because they want to do, they want to fly. You know, they have that primal instinct of wanting to fly and the people getting rowdy. Um, yeah, they have a little bit of mental problems for sure. Um, if I look at my group of friends, I would argue that a lot of them, do have mental problems. Um, but I don't want to generalize base jumpers because, you know, a lot of, a lot of like the common thing is like, Oh, like base jumpers must be suicidal, mm -hmm. which is just not true. Like nobody wants to go in. Nobody wants to see their friends go in. Mm -hmm. Like that is horrific. Yeah. Nobody like wants to be scrolling through Facebook and see their homies name pop up on the BFL Facebook. How did your, uh, how did your, family maybe accept this new sport like what's that dynamic like for them are they supportive you know a lot of angst how's that okay so this it's really interesting that you bring this up at first they didn't know because i kind of like i like as a climber you know watching valley uprising we'd see dean potter you know flying a wingsuit through yosemite um and it's just fucking yeah. rad and i would like show these clips to my parents like hey what do you think about this and it was like this is awful this is Whoa. awful and keep in mind like my dad is yeah and my dad is a severe adrenaline addict like okay i like growing up like i remember when i was eight years old i remember visiting him in the hospital because he stuck his bone out of his arm in three different places on a oh. 125 foot double riding a dirt bike oh my god um he drives sports cars really fast like i would i would almost argue that i was bred to do these <laughs> sports whatever that means but um i slowly started to to give them this like idea and they're like no and eventually my mother told me these words landon if you ever get into base jumping i will cut you out of the family <laughs> oh damn so for a long time i didn't tell her yeah. <laughs> for about my first 120 base jumps she did not know until finally somehow it kind of slipped through the cracks you know as all lies do yeah and then um you know as of last month me and my mother had a conversation on the phone about base jumping she told me she tried to research it as much as possible um and i just like explained to her like this is something that i do really want to do i'm really passionate about it i've never been drawn to something so far in my life i've never known that i wanted to do something so badly and my parents have always been highly supportive of my dreams and they were surprisingly like i don't think i don't think they're like they're not glad i'm doing it they're not happy i'm doing it mm -hmm. but they're not mad you know they're very like neutral but i think they'd prefer that i don't as with any good parents yeah if my kid came to me saying, I want to get into base, I would probably be like, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it, I think the allure is there, at least in my eyes, I I'm an adrenaline junkie as well. It's like, obviously jumping off a cliff and, and succeeding and not killing yourself is probably one of the coolest fucking things in the, the earth that a human can do. <laughs> um, but you know, <laughs> the risks there are real. And I think that like, I, it's interesting that you said like, it's, you know, they're the rowdy bunch and then there's the highly calculated bunch. And at least for me, like I would tend, I feel like I'd lean more towards the, the calculated bunch, but I'm but not the sure rowdy if, bunch is so fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if I would like, I don't know with climbing, I, I take on an inherent amount of risk, you know, like 
I don't really know if the trad placements are going to hold, but I climb anyway. And, but like that margin for risk is a lot smaller with base jumping. It's like, I like, I don't know, like the amount of planning and stuff that would go into it. I'm not sure that I would like, um, be willing to like spend as much time meticulously making sure that I wouldn't kill myself. Well, and that's actually what I like. Um, so I, I do prim- primarily slider off base jumping, meaning that we're typically jumping smaller objects, um, taking zero to four second delays, typically no more than three, four seconds really hurts your back. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, and then, you know, slider up, you know, there is something that slows the opening of the parachute. So people are jumping at terminal velocity, um, you know, jumping like large cliffs in Yosemite, louder Brunin. Um, and I actually don't have a ton of interest in doing that. What I really like is I like the, uh, the meticulous planning and the, uh, the analysis of the object and trying to figure like, I'm trying to figure out a way to say this without incriminating myself. I really like urban base jumping because of uh, the, the, what it takes to do it successfully. The process, like the jump only lasts, you know, you fall for three seconds, maybe if the object's tall enough and then you're flying the dumbest canopy on the planet. The canopies are really easy to fly. Um, people are going to get mad at me for saying that, but they are. Um, it's you have action for like a minute and that's fun, but I really, really like the process. Um, let's, uh, let's wrap this up talking about, uh, speed, speed flying real quick. Um, cause to me, honestly, I feel like speed flying must almost is more dangerous than base jumping. Is okay. that true? I don't think so. Okay. That being said, that being said, the amount of friends that have gotten hurt base jumping in the last six months that I know personally that are in my circle are zero. Now, I would like to argue that more base jumpers have fatalities than accidents. Now, speed flying, um, I'm not going to name names. I just had a really good friend break both his ankles and his back um, in American Fort Canyon. A um, couple months before that, I had a good friend break his leg. A couple months before that, I had a few friends break their back. Um, so this is, think, not, this is not wingsuit. This is like the, the, like the smaller canopy and you're like, like you're doing ripping like by yeah, so, right? Yeah, Here, let yeah, me yeah. let me explain speed flying because I think base jumping is like pretty like everybody knows what that is. Like, you know, the explosion of YouTube and GoPro kind of showed that to everybody. But what speed flying is, is so it breaks off from paragliding. So what paragliding is, is taking a Ram Air airfoil, which is basically an inflatable uh, glider wing and going and flying off mountaintops and trying to stay in the air for as long as possible. Well, what speed flying is, is we took these paragliders and, you know, we'll say a a standard paraglider is 20 to 24 square meters in surface area. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, a speed wing is anywhere from six meters in surface area to 15 meters in surface area. Wow. So you're going a lot faster. And instead of trying to stay up for long periods of time, it's closer to downhill mountain biking. We are trying to get from point A to point B as fast as possible. And with uh, as much contact contact with the terrain as possible. So you're trying to do barrel rolls and dives to stay and fly the terrain because, you know, speed is only relative to the objects around you. You know, you could be traveling hundreds of miles per hour in an airplane, but it's going to feel like you're doing nothing. But the moment, you know, you're flying 60 miles per hour, an inch off the train, it's like, oh, my gosh, I am going highly fast. Mm -hmm. Um. But it is really dangerous, and I think it can be done sustainably. I have friends that have done it for years and never had an accident or, you know, only had one accident. Or you can rush your progression. Um, I rushed my progression, quite frankly. I don't want to hide that. And you can break yourself. Yeah, I guess the closer yeah, it you seems are like to the, the margin terrain, for error the is pretty small. lower the margin for error. Exactly, yeah. Co- correct. And, you know, um, the draw towards speed flying for me is it is incredibly fun. It is uh, probably the most fun I've ever had um, in my entire life. Um, I was talking to an ex-professional climber who actually used to speed fly. And he said, yeah, I think that's the most fun I've ever had. Where base jumping for me is more of a tool. Um, it is easier to get off rock climbs, base jumping, and speed flying. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and not and originally the thought process is I was going to get into air sports to have a better way to descend from mountains. Um, and that actually is my end goal. I'm not going to be in climbing retirement forever, but I'm just waiting for motivation to hit or when I feel the need to seek it out. Mm -hmm. Oh man. Yeah. I think that's the, the gold standard is to climb up and fly off. Right. <laughs> and fly off. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, what gets yeah that's, that. that's yeah. the gold <laughs> standard. Well, and here, you know what, you know, it does get better than that, Max. So, um, two alpinists, I'm going to butcher their names. Um, one guy's name is Will and I can't remember the other man's name, but there was an article about this probably in rock and ice or XC magazine. And then they put out a, short film. I highly encourage people to watch it. It's called A New Way Up. And what they did is in Pakistan, they took cross-country paragliders and they flew their paragliders into the Karakoram, into the deep mountains of Pakistan, what would usually be a three-day trek, put up a first ascent, and then they flew their paragliders back. You know, typically this would be a seven, eight, ten-day trip, round trip. They did this in three days round trip. Mm -hmm. Now, what I want to do is I would love to go and fly a cross-country paraglider somewhere deep into the mountains, set up a base camp, and then climb these mountains and then speed fly down them <laughs> and then fly paraglide. That's my, I, and I don't like talking about things before I do them, but that's yeah. my end goal is if I can figure out how to make this work. Have you coined the term for that yet? It sounds like the, the <laughs> infinity loop or the FKT, like what's this one called? So it's already been termed. Um, and I guess not with speed flying. I think just speed flying is something that I want to add to the mix because I think speed flying is super rad. But um, I think it'd be considered para alpinism. So like, uh, you know, paragliding alpinism. So like right now, the people pushing that sport would be like what comes to my mind is like uh, David Chen, undercover crusher. Nobody knows who he is. He's this Kiwi who is an amazing alpinist and an amazing paraglider. Highly recommend you guys get him on if you can. Um, his partner out. is Cedar Wright. Oh, okay. Yeah, Cedar, I know. I, I see him fly a whole bunch. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and Cedar's a fantastic one of the he's he's one of the better cross country paragliding pilots and obviously wow. a phenomenal rock climber. Yeah. Yeah. But wow. I, I thought it was funny. They did a trip to Pakistan together to go do some paralpinism. And I don't think the weather and I don't know this, but I think the weather didn't quite work out properly. And they ended up uh flying and then getting to do some bouldering and then getting to climb like a three pitch rock climb and then fly back. But even still like that is awesome. The multi-sport adventure. If all you yeah. did was just fly and fly out, it would be awesome. So say goodbye to your hiking legs. Up. Everyone's yeah. going to get lazy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've hiked more than I ever had in my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, awesome, man. I think, uh, you know, that's a great place to leave it. Um, thanks for coming on the show, man. I feel like we had a really awesome conversation. Appreciate you taking the time out of your day. And, um, yeah, I just, uh, appreciate you being here. No, thank you for having me. This is the first time I've ever done something like this. I was, I was pretty nervous, but, uh, <laughs> I'm happy I got the experience to do it. And thank you guys. Yeah, man. No, it was great having you on the show. And, uh, dude, you seem like a total natural, man. You, you spoke really well. It was a great experience chatting with you. I honestly would not have guessed that you were, uh, you know, you said you're 21, right? Yeah. That's crazy, man. You've got, you know, so many amazing years ahead of you and you know, I'm barely older than you, but you know, <laughs> like nine years is still, still a long age. So yeah, man. Uh, yeah. You know, stay safe out there, have fun flying and, uh, look forward to, you know, seeing you do some things in the future. Hey, thanks guys. I appreciate it. Thank you.